thanks for coming along tonight where we're here on the occasion of um, Michael's return to the Sydney Institute after some years, but on the occasion of the publication of Whitlam's Foreign Policy by Michael Eason. So our speaker will speak for about 30 minutes, we'll take questions and discussion, finish no later than the top of the hour. And I'll introduce Michael very briefly. Dr. Eason is chair of EG Funds. He, in, in his background includes as secretary of the Labor Council of New South Wales for many years, a vice president of the ACTU, ACTU and a senior vice president of the New South Wales branch of the Australian Labor Party. But as I said here tonight, discussing Gough Whitlam's foreign policy. Michael, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Jared. And Jared and Anne, former Prime Minister John Howard, distinguished guest comrades. <laughs> I, I pay my respect to the Gadigal people of the Honora Nation, to elders past, present and emerging. At a book launch, every author fears this question. You never mention was there a reason why, followed by a smirk and an impish gotcha smile. Given recent events, I admit the, uh, the oversight. I might as well address this early. There was an act by Whitlam of immense global and cultural significance to Australia that I forgot to mention. In, br speak up yes, I'll try, uh, yeah. in bringing this up now, I suspect some constitutional conservatives will cavil at this reminder of the man going beyond his prime ministerial remit, typical of Whitlam. Of course, I'm thinking of that afternoon in September 1974, when a young Australian Barry McKenzie returned to Australia from London with his aunt Edna Everidge. As the latter courtesy to Gough and Margaret Whitlam, the Prime Minister said, Arise, Dame Edna. From that moment, Dame Edna began her conquest of, of the showbiz world. Finally, when it came to appreciation of Australia, something other than Vegemite, shark attacks and killer spiders began to capture world attention. No matter whether Gough had the right to confer such an imperial honour the best part of 49 years ago, I say there was a certain grandeur in his actions that <laughs> afternoon. Now, to account for Australian foreign policy, there was more to Whitlam's impact than that one instance. But the example offers a clue as to why Whitlam's long career is celebrated despite his many mistakes, including crass and impetuous judgment. He had a sense of humour. For example, during his prime ministership, visiting 15 countries in four weeks, on one occasion, reading that morning's Times newspaper, he quipped to his colleague with him, Dick Walcott, Have you seen this, comrade? Guinea-Bissau, Bangladesh and Grenada have just been admitted to the United Nations. They are creating these countries more quickly than I can visit them. <laughs> Uh, after meeting in 1977 Prime Minister Maraji Desai uh, in India, a believer in Eurotherapy, the medicinal benefits of drinking your own urine, Whitlam told the accompanying Australian journalists that the two had talked about how they handle a night out on the piss. <laughs> He honed his comedic skills with diligence as a means of political defence and offence. His speechwriter and Boswell, Graham Freudenberg, once said. Whitlam also stood for ideas and principles that were worthy. I distinguish in the book between Whitlamism and Whitlam the man. <laughs> 
Sometimes he let himself down and some of the action contradict the ideals he might otherwise have championed. In the last 50 years, apologies to anyone present, no Australian political leader has had as much influence on Australian politics as Gough Whitlam. Some of his greatest impacts were on foreign policy. He made mistakes, unnecessarily annoyed some allies, was sometimes careless in the niceties of diplomacy. And this monograph, in a humanely critical spirit, evaluates the realist Whitlam, the idealist Whitlam, the great performer, the flawed man. Necessarily briefly, I discuss the promise, creativity, problems and influence of Whitlam's foreign policy. By looking objectively at key policy challenges and decisions made by Whitlam in the context of his time, some lasting impacts of the challenges and decisions made are highlighted. I discuss five hallmarks of policy initiative, China relations, Papua New Guinea independence, the end of the line, the settlement on the joint Australian-US defence bases, Indonesian relations. Then a matter of minor significance, his trips, the, and then areas of controversy, the Vietnamese refugees, East Timor independence, recognition of the Baltic states, Middle East policy, and the attempted Iraqi Ba'ath Party loan transaction in 1975. Through such analysis, mature reflection on Australia's legacy in relation to its obligation and treatment of our alliances, commitment to the region and human rights, and appreciation of the idealist and realist strands of Whitlam's approach to foreign policy is possible. The five hallmarks that I talk about are China, PNG, and as the base of Indonesia. On China, Whitlam was courageous to go there in 1971. And it was, uh, I remember it being at school uh, and hearing that when Whitlam was in Tokyo, that Kissinger was in, uh, in Beijing. And wow, this must mean that Labor will win the election, I thought. Uh, but it was also appropriate, I think, to, uh, to establish those relations. And as I mentioned in the book, Whitlam early in 1954 argued that Australia should recognise the People's Republic of China. I found it interesting in doing some research to discover the memo that Whitlam wrote to the first ambassador to China, uh, to the People's Republic of China, that is, I mean, Stephen Fitzgerald, and I give credit to James Cohen for having unearthed this, that he wrote a memo about relations with Taiwan. And he said, we should take the Chinese government at their word about peaceful reunification and continued people-to-people -people visits and trade between Australia and Taiwan should be allowed. So that was an interesting perspective all that time ago. And I think China is an example of the realist Whitlam, thinking we need to make some accommodation with that country and establish relations. And one can, uh, can see many legacies of that pursued by subsequent governments. On Papua New Guinea, it's a more controversial decision, I guess, uh, agreeing to independence and doing so in 1975. Some have argued that we rushed to independence too quickly. I actually agree and argue in the book with why the move and the date of the move in 1975 was better than delay. And in particular, I have in mind the possibility of breakaway from PNG, including in Bougainville and elsewhere, and therefore, I think that the achievement of PNG independence, which was cross, which was bipartisan with the opposition spokesman Andrew Peacock supporting early independence, uh, 
uh, was appropriate. And it's significant that when the Australian flag went down in PNG and the new PNG flag flew from Port Moresby, the, the Governor General, Sir John Guy, made the remark that Australia left P uh, PNG not despised and spat upon, but honoured and respected. And I think that the, that, that was a, a good achievement of the Australian government and him. Now, Anders and the American alliance was a very rocky situation, and especially given the bombing of Haiphong and Hanoi and other parts of North Vietnam at the end of 1972 and early 73, and has been revealed in various publications since. Uh, Nixon directed, I don't want to any Whitlam or any politician to be visiting the White House. It was a moment of very fractured and tense relations because a number of ministers, including more left-wing ministers in the government, were extremely undisciplined in their criticisms of the United States and the US president. And it's credit to Andrew Peacock, who visited the United States and counselled uh, the then uh, leader of the uh, national president, I think he was, of the uh, Republican National Committee, George Bush, uh, who introduced Peacock to Vice President Spiro Agnew, that if the president were to decline to meet with Prime Minister Whitlam, that would be very damaging for Australian-US relations, so you should meet him. And when the meeting did occur, um, you, you had uh, a, a much better stabilisation of relations between Australia and the United States. And particularly relevant to that are the US bases or the Joint Defence Facility, as they more meaningfully became in the Whitlam period. Before I, I, I go to that point, I, I point out that at page 38, as I was doing my research here for the book, I thought I would try and find some photos of Whitlam. And I found a photo of Whitlam with President Johnson in the, on the oval lawn of the White House with a bevy of beauties from the uh, from the rural electrification uh, program in Texas. And I thought, gosh, Whitlam making his first visit to the United States in 1967, a few, mo few months after he became the leader of the opposition, I wondered if this was indicative of him just being fitted in uh, impolitely uh, at such a venue. But I discovered, and I'm glad I did, uh, in doing further research that actually he spent four hours with Pre President Lyndon Bain Johnson, that Harold Holt had encouraged the President to meet the new leader of the opposition and gave it his blessing, and, and the Australian Prime Minister Holt uh, visited uh, President Johnson at his ranch uh, a few weeks later. So it was interesting that Johnson had this engaging hour at the, uh, in the Oval Office, then a couple of hours on the lawn of the White House, and then at, and there Johnson said, this is a man we will hear a lot more about in the future, this great man, Gough Whitlam. And then they met the Reverend Billy Graham. So four hours were spent with, uh, with Johnson. And I think that was indicative of, of Whitlam realising that as a new leader of the Australian Labor Party, he needed to, to burnish his credentials as being a safe pair of hands with respect to the US alliance. Now, the joint defence facilities, as they're now known, uh, the, were very controversial in the Labor Party. And in fact, in 1958, when the Labor Party conference considered whether Labor would support the Northwest Cape uh, facilities and Pine Gap, the, that was the time where Gough Whitlam, as deputy leader of the opposition, and Arthur Corwell, as leader of the opposition, were photographed under a lamppost in Canberra, <laughs> waiting for the decision 
of the National Conference of the Party. And it was a humiliating moment in Labor Party history. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so it was very controversial and there was a vote by two, I, I think it was um, uh, two votes, which determined in favour of uh, arguing for greater Australian control of those facilities. But all of this was undecided and unresolved when Whitlam came into power, certainly within the Labor Party. And wherever you stand in politics, it's in all of our interests that we have bipartisanship on these major questions. And Whitlam helped achieve that within the Labor Party. And he helped sell the argument that the joint facility with joint Australian-US control were important for the peace of the world. Not only for the United States to be able to have early warning of what uh, uh, movement there might be in other parts of the world indicating a potential strike, but also it's in the interests of the adversaries that there is a system of checks and balances and early warning that adds to the confidence of uh, the, the uh, world defence uh, architecture. Whitlam also spent a lot of time developing friendships in Indonesia, including his period in opposition, regularly visiting. And I think the forging of closer relations within Indonesia is one of the hallmarks of Whitlam's period as Prime Minister. I now turn to some controversy. Vietnam. Exiting Australia from Vietnam um, was one of the things Whitlam prioritised in opposition. By the time he became the government, there was less than 200 advisers in Vietnam. And so, uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of controversy about US policy and bombing of North <coughs> Korea at the relevant time. North Sorry. North Vietnam. North Vietnam, I mean, I mean my apologies, uh, et cetera. But I think Whitlam broadly, after that rocky and unbalanced beginning, broadly handled this matter well, excepting when the refugees came. And it's certainly the case that Whitlam was unsympathetic to the Vietnamese refugees coming, and that's a blot on his legacy. Uh, with respect to East Timor, the invasion of East Timor by the Indonesian uh, forces occurred during the caretaker period between the dismissal and uh, the election of the Fraser government at the end of 1975. But it's also the case, I think, that Whitlam was unsympathetic to the rights of small nation. In some respects, the conflict between the idealist and realist Whitlam comes to the fore here, because social democratic parties tend to favour self-determination, and yet he was of the view that why, uh, Indonesia, uh, Indonesia would take East Timor because of the basket case and the Portuguese were only second to the Belgians in being the worst colonial masters. They left nothing behind. The only thing they did leave behind were all of the weapons that uh, the governor of, uh, uh, of East Timor when he fled back to Portugal, he left them all behind and threatened took them. And we know that in Angola and Mozambique, uh, radical Marxist governments were established soon after. And also, we uh, know that the Cubans were all of a sudden fighting in those particular countries to preserve those governments. So one can understand the Indonesian perspective in Whitlam's reservation. But I think he was on the wrong side of history on that issue. With respect to the Baltic states, no one knows why Whitlam uh, recognised uh, the Baltic states' incorporation into the Soviet Union. It was a complete madness. Uh, it's clear that Alan Renouf, the head of the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, recommended that that should occur as a goodwill gesture in the spirit of detente between the major superpowers. Completely ludicrous. And, uh, but Whitlam signed off on it, and, and one can guess what might have been crossing his mind. But I noted that uh, Graham Freudenberg said he didn't understand it either, why that occurred. Uh, other controversies include 
uh, the Middle East, and I think Whitlam adopted a bipartisan position with respect to the right of Israel and the Palestinians to exist in in their own states <coughs> with secure and recognised borders, and that formula has been followed by subsequent governments. But Whitlam lacked sympathy for Israel, especially when it was attacked in 1973. And I think that lack of empathy for Israel is a blot against him. One, I think a true friend of Israel, as I am, uh, should recognise the right of the Palestinians to exist also in their, uh, their own homeland. Very complicated, but I think uh, I try to address the Middle East aspect of Whitlam's period as Prime Minister as fairly as I could. What is the most inexplicable thing that happened in Whitlam's period uh, as leader of the Labor Party was the uh, agreement to try and accept uh, Iraqi Ba'ath Socialist Party money from uh, the government of Saddam Hussein. And uh, Bill Hartley, the former secretary of the Victorian Labor Party, a mad, crazy lefty uh, who really uh, from, uh, earned that title, and David Coombe, the confused national secretary of the Labor Party, proposed to Whitlam <coughs> there's a way of getting some money uh, for the election campaign in 1975 and we need to keep it hush-hush and we should raise that money and that could help us tide us over. There were very few corporate donations in that period. <laughs> uh, John Howard will understand why. Uh, so that is clearly the most uh, ludicrous aspect of Whitlam's period as leader of the Labor Party. I once, as a young student, asked, Diamond Jim McClellan, a Labor senator and former minister in the end of the Whitlam government. How do you explain this? And he paused and said um, he went mad. Uh, but don't judge him just on that. Uh, and he then, he then urged Bill Hayden to uh, challenge Whitlam, even though Whitlam had just been re-elected leader. Uh, thereafter, so that to the credit of Jim McClellan at that time. So, um, in the brief time left to me, um, how big a splash did Whitlam make? I think two actions continue to resonate 50 years later. Uh, the, the renewing of the US alliance in the context of reaching agreement on the joint defence facility was a really great achievement. And the legacy of that continued by subsequent governments and arguably improved by subsequent governments is one thing that I think Whitlam deserves credit for. Uh, improving relations and focus with our countries to our north, particularly China <coughs> and Indonesia, is to his credit. He insisted on more control over US engagement on Australian soil. He mostly settled that controversy, as I mentioned. And, 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 and I think that, in my view, looking back, one of his greatest achievements. On China, he envisaged a relationship which relied on an independent Australia and a stable China accepting of the US alliance. It's interesting that some of the first visit by senior Chinese leaders to the West were to Australia. For example, both Hu Yaobang as Chinese Communist Party General Secretary in 1985 and Zhao Zijiang, the then Premier in 1983, made Australia the first country that they visited in the West. A tribute to the close relations established in and after Whitlam's time. It's a worthy ambition to be a Zheng Yu, the true friend. That ought to be a continuing prime objective, begun by Whitlam, pursued by subsequent Australian government, notwithstanding the current left adventurism of President Xi Jinping. The Whitlam attractively advocated Australia's place in the world with a realistic yet principled outlook. He urged Australians to discard the dread and fear 
that the country is trapped on the outside of an incomprehensible Asia. He moved away from the quagmire of Vietnam. He decisively shifted Australia's sensitivity to engender better relations with most Asian nations. With Indonesia, to his great credit, he recognised how bitter the colonial experience had been and clearly accounted for it in Australian policy. It was not all good, however. Whitland's views on the Vietnamese refugees and East Timor diminished his standing. It, and uh, what else can be said about Whitland's worldview, his method of pursuing Australia's national interest? As we know from what I've already said, it was complicated. He saw the world as it is, as he said in 1973, a generous foreign policy rests upon a proper balance between power and obligation. The aim is to develop foreign policies which are realistic and generous, enlightened yet pragmatic. Pragmatic means in part a true recognition of the world as it is. That quote from Whitlam in 73. Critics of Whitlam really understood that his appeal laid in what he confidently proclaimed about what should and could be. In that pragmatic worldview, there was a nobility of purpose. Yet in foreign policy and politics generally, the personal is always a factor. Whitlam's brilliant in 1971, overruling a number of advisers, including Freudenberg, in going to China, made him think he could do anything. In politics and foreign policy making, hubris can be the partner of the bold and creative. If Whitlam had a better consulted with Senator Don Willisey, his foreign minister from December, November uh, 1973, and with close figures in his cabinet and even his ministry, some mistakes might have been avoided or mitigated. Willisey had sound political instincts and a sense of decency that could have been better utilised. The effort to do good while advancing the national interest and educating the Australian public along the way is fundamental to foreign policy and, and of continuing appeal. Yet today, some of the best of what began in Whitlam's time and continued by subsequent government is in danger of diminishing. If business-to-business -business interaction, the learning of Indonesian and other languages, Asian languages in Australian schools is part of the evidence, there's a dramatic fall in the numbers studying Asian languages and society. This represents part of the closing of the Australian mind, intellectual, linguistic, cultural and business to deeper relation with the various countries to Australia's north. Finally, Dean Atchison, American Secretary of State under President Truman, once said that the foreign policy doer is like a gardener who must, quote, use the forces of life, growth and nature to his purpose, unquote. With the perspective of half a century, we can see results. Some seeds fell on stony ground, some among thorns, some struggled to take root. Those fruits successfully harvested, those unpicked, can now be analysed for a fresh uh, appraisal. Thank you. So, um, many thanks, Michael. And uh, as I said, copies of Whitlam's Foreign Policy by Michael Eason, published by Connor Court in Brisbane, all its books printed in Australia. Um, it's on sale tonight. And Michael will be happy to sign a copy or copies for you of that, I'm sure. So if you come back here now, Michael, and um, come back. Yep. Can we just, I just wonder, I mean, Gough Whitlam was good to the institute. He spoke here once and uh, we had a good relationship. I was often, sometimes critical, but we got on okay. But can I raise the issue about how serious he was? You've mentioned the Baltic states and as you know, John Howard reminds me what were so the so-called secret protocols of the Nazi Soviet pact were not secret in 1974 and 1975 when Gough Whitlam recognised the de jure, the incorporation of the Soviet Union of the Baltic states uh, 
which was a consequence of the 1939 Nazi-Soviet pact. Now you go on to mention this visit to meet um, Premier Kasigan in the Soviet Union, who's an heir of Stalin, Kasigan, okay? Um, the old, an old Stalinist. Just come forward here. And you quote um, the former Labour, uh, prominent Labour figure Lionel Bowen, telling John Faulkner, a good historian, who told Frank Brennan. So all these people are pretty, pretty responsible people. That when Kosygin asked Whitlam in 1975, in a visit in Moscow, after we've recognised the Soviet incorporation of the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, uh, he asked Gough Whitlam, um, well, what do you want? Would you, would you like something like a trade agreement? Whitlam says, quote, I don't want to talk with you about mundane things like trade. I want to know what happened to the Grand Duchess Anastasia in 1918. <laughs> now, now it's funny, but that's an incredibly irresponsible thing for an Australian leader to say to a Stalinist thug, knowing that the Soviet Union wasn't going to say what happened to the royal family under the Bolsheviks in 1918 in any event. So how serious was he? Well, he wasn't very serious at that moment. And, <laughs> and as Lionel Bowen says in telling the story, there was no trade agreement that year. <laughs> um, look, I, when he did recognise the de, de jure incorporation of the Baltic states, uh, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia into the Soviet Union, he never consulted his foreign minister, Don Willisie, who was in Peru at the time. And look, that's an example of someone who, who should have told that story uh, with colleague before a meeting or after a meeting, not at the meeting. Uh, absolutely. So I agree with that criticism. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Whitlam was foreign minister as well as prime minister for some of his prime ministership? Yes, he was, and, from and December 1972 to November 1973. And what was the impact of holding those two, which have otherwise been separate and important jobs at the same time, on the conduct of Australia's government, you know, his government generally, and the foreign policy? I think he would have been better advised to have given the portfolio to someone else, especially given the first period of his prime ministership. He was recognising many countries we hadn't previously recognised, including North Vietnam, East Germany and a whole host of other countries uh, outside of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, I, I think it was... Uh, he just loved foreign affairs. And when his memoirs were published, I think the section dealing with international relations was 180 pages and uh, the average of the other chapters was 22. Um, <laughs> so it indicated he was really interested in being foreign minister as well as prime minister. Michael, um, thanks for your talk. It's a very balanced and um, assessment and, uh, and a lot of insights there. But there's one insight that I was sort of looking for which I couldn't find, was, was the, the curious um, episode where Whitlam listened to the likes of Hartley and Coombs in getting that Iraqi money. And I know you said that uh, he went sort of temporarily mad, but to, to me it doesn't seem like a very satisfying explanation. And I would have wondered whether there might be some other evidence that would throw some light on it. Uh, Michael, you might just say who Hartley and Coombs were, OK? I did refer to them in the book yes. and earlier, but Bill Hartley was a former secretary of the Labor Party in Victoria who was displaced in 1971 when federal intervention occurred in Victoria. And, and Whitlam previously despised him as this crazy left winger who uh, did so much to damage Labor's prospects of winning seats in Victoria. David Coombe the National Secretary of the Labor Party and the campaign director for the successful 1972 election and the 1974 election. And um, so for them to come up with this idea of getting half a million US dollars, which never arrived from Iraq, 
was completely mad. I, I think the fact that it was secretive, the fact that they intended to keep it a secret should it had have been successful, left Whitlam open to blackmail and it, it raised all sorts of questions as to what um, policies might be adopted subsequently. It's the darkest blot on Whitlam's reputation. I don't understand it. Michael, the economic circumstances of the period you're talking about, how much did the difficulties and the increasing inflation and the like affect his thinking about foreign affairs? Look, um, he wanted to cultivate relations with the OPEC nations, the oil nations, and that was a factor in us, Australia being represented at the non-alignment uh, movement uh, conferences and he also wanted to uh, attend OPEC meetings as an observer. So uh, he wanted to cultivate relations with those oil economies and his minister Rex Connor had the view that we could borrow a lot of money from these company, uh, countries uh, and, uh, and, and fund major uh, mining infrastructure projects in Australia. So it clearly weighed in his thinking. I don't see the name Vince Gare in the index. I presume he didn't consult anyone when he sent Vince off to Ireland either. I don't know whether he consulted many people, but I still enjoy the story that Laurie Oakes once told when he heard there might be a senator appointed to a diplomatic post from the non-Labor side, that he rang Mrs Gare at home and said, I believe congratulations are in order. <laughs> And she shared the story, and he, and he had the scoop. Just by way of background, Vince Gare was the Democratic Labor Party senator, right? Yes. Yeah. He was the Premier of Queensland when I think all of the Cabinet Ministers, other than one or two, were expelled from the Labor Party in Queensland in 1957 on the question of long service leave. <laughs> And they then formed the Queensland Labor Party and later merged with the Democratic Labor Party. Thank, thank you for your comments, Mark, uh, Michael. Um, you talked about PNG. I was wondering if one of the idealisms that uh, Whitlam was attracted to or committed to was decolonisation, and if it wasn't, what was the motivation for PNG? Um, he, once, he said in his memoirs, if I'm remembered for nothing else other than the forging of independence of PNG, I would be happy, word to that effect. And he very much had the view that we shouldn't be a colonial power and was better for <coughs> people in PNG to run their own country. And he had great faith in people like Michael Samari and uh, Sir John Guys and others. And uh, I, I think that was why he believed that we should do that. And he feared that Australia would become a pariah as a colonial power. And he also had the view that there could be breakaway provinces such as in particular Bougainville and therefore accelerate the independent period, uh, uh, process. Uh, hi. Whitlam government implemented the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, part of it was to end up uh, white Australia policy and improve Australian standing in international fora. How did it work? Um, well, I think Whitlam paid great tribute to the multicultural nation that we are. And I remember to tell a story. I remember going out to Ma the Marconi Club out at Fairfield. And there were all of these uh, Italian labourers and market gardeners and other people at that time in the mid-70s. And Whitlam decided to lecture everyone about the debt we owed to Roman and Italian law. <laughs> and all of these people were just completely puffed up and proud of themselves. It was indicative of Whitlam uh, 
interest in 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 building up the confidence of uh, of what we used to call the new Australian. Uh, one interesting thing that the mark against Whitlam with respect to foreign policy is that one of the conferences, the International Conference of Women in 1974, I think, in in Mexico City, there was a resolution uh, condemning racism and so on and so forth and condemning Zionism, which we voted for, which was something we should never have done. Thank you. Whitlam was very defensive in writing and also in various conferences I went to about his role in East Timor, about the Indonesian invasion in December 75. The suggestion has been made that he um, gave the nod to the Indonesian government and there's some evidence about that. But I want to hear what, what you've unearthed about the evidence and what your position is about Whitlam's um, possible um, support of Indonesia at that time. Well, um, I know Bruce Watson has written a book on the very topic, so I hesitate to, uh, uh, to comment in detail, other than to say that I deal with these questions in the book uh, in a brief way. Uh, Kim E. Beasley, Kim Beasley Sr., made the remark in Heath memoirs that Whitlam had no time for the rights of small countries. And that, that, so he adopted a similar view to East Timor as he did to the Baltic states. And you could say that he was consistent. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor. Let me ask you a question. Um, I just want to make a brief uh, historical observation and, and get, then get your perspective. Uh, the time the Whitlam visited China, and that was the, um, during the peak of uh, Cold War, and uh, China was a very insecure uh, country because they faced uh, both hostility from the American in the in the south and uh, but also uh, they faced uh, Russian in the north. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is the after Whitlam visited China also uh, very uh, closely followed by the American president. So the um, basically China after that they decided to join the West and after 10 years then the whole Soviet Union uh, collapsed. And that's the time of the era of unipolar world because American become the superpower. And China very much benefit from that because then once that happened, those two external hostilities then all disappear. And that's why they had a, a 20 years of uh, uh, economic rise. Uh, but now China and Russia argue for a, uh, they prefer a world of multipolar uh, order. Uh, so, uh, so uh, that's not the. Uh, uh, I mean, they, once you have that order, then uh, basically you have no uh, security. No, there's a lot of uncertainties, and uh, the um, uh, for especially for business, like you know, no one want to um, okay. make a long term investment. Because thank you very much. Um, I think that's more of an observation, but maybe I could make this observation. When Whitlam visited China in 1971, Deng Xiaoping was still in a factory working. Uh, he hadn't been rehabilitated. Uh, and China only began to change after Mao died and after the Gang of Four were turfed out. I, I found it a little um, odd that Whitlam was so sentimental about Mao Zedong given the murders that he had committed and the atrocities that occurred under Chinese Communist Party rule. There is a view, a controversial view, a minority view that the visits of Whitlam and then more, more importantly Henry Kissinger propped up a failing, corrupt, murderous regime and, uh, and it did well for a while and then it did badly again and now we've got it where it is. But the question is to what extent did Whitlam prop up Mao because Mao was that regime was in terrible trouble. I mean, I think in the Cultural Revolution, 100 million people were purged, including a couple of the leaders you mentioned. That's 100 million people out of 800 million people. That's a pretty, when you take the fact that they're mainly males and they're mainly older people, that's a huge percentage. This regime was falling apart. Whitlam didn't see it. Kissinger didn't see it. Um, 
Look, I think American policy was then to forge an alliance with China against the Soviet Union, and I think that was tactically wise. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, communist China. Michael, this is outside the, the realm and the sphere of uh, your book. I, I imagine it, it will go well for your second or third book <laughs> on, on Mr. Whitlam. But um, did he? I, I, when I was young, I, rem I remember watching uh, politics from a distance. I was more interested in theology. But it was like it was a steamroller heading towards the Labor government that they didn't see coming. And, and the, the shock and horror that seemed to occur when supply was denied and the implication of a collaboration between the Governor-General and, and, and the um, coalition and stuff. I mean, did, did not the other very bright and brilliant people in the Labor Party perceive this was going to be a catastrophic end? Some people did, and they didn't game plan it sufficiently. They didn't game plan it sufficiently. Uh, I, I think the better view today is that when, given that impasse, the Governor-General had the right and arguably the duty to intervene, but he should have counselled and warned his Prime Minister. And that's the case against Kerr, Mr John Kerr. No, thanks, Michael, for a very interesting... Very interesting talk. I just really wanted to make just an observation about Timor. Um, you know, I think you've been slightly benign on regarding Whitlam on uh, East Timor. Uh, his role was far more intrusive than most people think. In fact, an Indonesian cabinet document came my way which showed that at his first meeting with Suharto, he basically told him to m move on or incorporate... Didn't It didn't... Uh, to incorporate Timor... Uh, you know, because of the problems of you know, communism going forward. And he also reminded him that, as you've mentioned about Cuban troops in Africa, that there would uh, be, the, that there had been Cuban troops fighting alongside and we really didn't want this in our part of the world. So Whitlam denied that he encouraged uh, Sahato, but the problem with diplomats around the world writing things down is that eventually all of these things come to light. And the argument, and I think your book refers to the meeting between President Suharto and Whitlam in Townsville, I think in September 1975, where some of the argument is that Whitlam said we wouldn't have a problem if this happened. I, I want to come back to some of the early... Can you hear me now? Some of the earlier questions touched on this, but these days in a much more globalised world economy, the distinction that was more real in Whitlam's day than today between foreign policy and international economic policy has kind of disintegrated. So I'm tempted to ask you what was his greatest from an international perspective, his greatest economic contribution. And in particular, um, just reflecting on those earlier questions, I mean, a bilateral deal with the Kremlin is one thing on trade policy. But his very early, very dramatic and very brave decisions on exchange rate policy and the beginning of, yes, a long, slow process on tariff rate policy without which we would not be integrated with the rest of the world, let alone with, with Asia. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to know how you see that, Mike. There, there is a chapter in a book edited by Scott Prasser and David Kloon on the Whitlam government, which describes his tariff policy. And I think that's a good indication of Whitlam thinking. And he declared at the time, I'm a Rattigan man. Rattigan, Alf Rattigan being the head of the Industry Assistant Commission who recommended to Whitlam a 25% cut on tariffs. So I think Whitlam was more of a free trader than anything else. Uh, Michael, I'm just wondering if he was here today, where would he sit in the room between Penny Wong and Paul Keating? Good question. 
Good question. Um, look, it, I think it's pointless uh, asking where would people stand if they were there today. The world is so very different. And the most significant change is Xi Jinping being much more aggressive and much more ideological in his approach to foreign policy. China has only a few allies in Asia. Burma, for the wrong reasons, Cambodia, for the wrong reasons, and to some degree, North Korea. Uh, all the other neighbours um, are very critical of the Chinese bullying, and notwithstanding even what some people say publicly, uh, that Australia has adopted the posture it has in recent times. And, that, and it's good that it's a bipartisan position across uh, the former government and the current government. So, um, but where would Whitlam have stood? Who knows? But I, 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 I think uh, uh, he would have... I, I think it's important that Australia form its own views, and we do. And we robustly form those views, taking into account the kind of criticism that you've referred to. Thanks, Michael, for his amazing topic, this man. Um, but as someone who lives through it, I have much to thank Whitlam for because inflation was so high or went so fast that as a, one of a young married couple, we managed to get into the property market thanks to the increase in the value of one house over two years. I mean, it was... I remember it as chaotic, disturbing, um, monumentally um, wrong-visioned period of Whitlam. And I remember Susan Ryan coming to the Sydney Institute years ago and saying the success of the Hawke-Keating government was that they learned from the mistakes of Whitlam and they were never going to repeat them again. So what is it about Whitlam? And I find it very entertaining, this discussion. What is it about the man who is constantly talked about, constantly written about, constantly held up as a hero, but in fact he was one of our worst prime ministers, prime ministers as a manager? Um, can I recommend another essay in the book edited by Scott Prather and David Kloon comparing Whitlam and Hawke? And that is by Mary Eason, um, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> and she, she wrote about the legacy of Whitlam informing the, uh, the, the kind of government the Hawke-Keating government became. And Keating is quoted extensively there about how bad Goff was in economic policy. Look, I remember as, uh, as a young man, um, tr my hands trembling as a member of the Labor Party, reading the newspapers, finding out what we did the night before. Um, so it was uh, a moment of time where, uh, where, where uh, a lot of mistakes were made and it was chaotic. I did think they were getting their act together at the end. That's another question, but I think with uh, Diamond Jim McClellan, Joe Reardon, uh, Joe Berenson, Bill Hayden as Treasurer, Labor was finally getting its act together. Uh, I do think, however, that Whitlam's ideals were impressive. He, The man made loads of mistakes, and that's what I tried to do in this book, focus on foreign policy rather than the rest of the Whitlam legacy in trying to draw a distinction between the man and the ideals. Final question. Tell us about your own... You would have had some kind of relationship with Gough Whitlam. You would have known him around the Labor movement, the Labor Party uh, but in particular, the broader Labor movement. How did you find him personally? Yeah. Look, I found him witty, um, thoughtful, interesting, inspiring. Then I grew up. Um, <laughs> and, and then, look, I... I I, 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 get, I mentioned in the book, I give credit to my social science teacher in year eight or second form in those days, clearly bored with the curriculum, and he asked everyone in Morris Brothers Pencils in the school of 60 people, uh, school with the line of uh, Barry Humphreys at the time, uh, and he asked all of the 60 in the room, uh, labour, most of the people, put up their hand. Who's liberal? Four people put up, put up their hand. Who's DLP? The rest. And he nominated three of us. He said, next week you're defending your choice. 
So I was defending Gough Whitlam, and that's where it began. <laughs> And uh, and that that's where it ends tonight. So many thanks to Michael for a, an informative and uh, amusing uh, and important um, talk tonight, and for producing the book published by Connor Court, Whitlam's Foreign Policy. Um, and good luck with the book, and thanks for a great night tonight.